in a day when we can simply swipe our fingers over the surface of a mobile phone to find answers to complex questions, it's hard to imagine the beginnings of the computer age when even modest calculations could take hours or days. Underneath the glossy exterior of the Samsung phone, you'll find software and components that were imagined, designed, and created in Trondheim by students from NTNU. The knowledge and creativity found at NTNU is at the core of this story. And it's arguable that this all had its start 50 years ago, when Gear, the university's first digital computer, came to Trondheim. The shift from no computer to computer is one of the biggest changes ever. It's difficult for us today to comprehend what this meant to engineering and to society. Before the computer, advanced calculating required someone to use this kind of machine. If you were good at it, you might get through a few thousand operations in a day. This machine could do hundreds of those operations every second. That was not just a quantitative increase in calculation power, it was a qualitative leap, a paradigm shift. It completely altered the practice of science and engineering, and it brought with it new disciplines, new skill sets, and the need for a new kind of education. You could even make it sing. When it came, no one knew what it was good for. Gear looked like a cupboard, like where I should hang my coat, in the words of Norman Sanders, who came to run the computing center in 1963. But once it was in place, it was like a floodgate opening. Students were especially eager to adopt this new technology. Teaching of computing started on a large scale when Gear came. Students had no doubts about the importance of the new discipline. By the first year, more than a thousand students had voluntarily taken courses in Algol in addition to their regular studies. The bars in Trondheim noticed. The students were busy learning. Gear is better than beer, Norman Sanders said. The first mainframe, a Univac 1107, filled a whole room. In computing, size matters. This is a mini machine. In the 1960s, you used computers for three things. Mathematical calculations, operations on big data sets, that was all done on the mainframes. But the third thing a computer could do was to help regulate and control. The great thing about a mini machine is that it's so small you can stick it into your instrument setup, in your chemical factory, in the machine room of your ship. You can use it to monitor a process and control it in real time. Scientists and students from the Department of Engineering Cybernetics were among the first to recognize how the computer could be used. Already by 1954, Jens Glad Balkin and his people had built an analog computer called Diana. It made important contributions to the automation of Norwegian industry. Norden from 1968 was Norway's first commercial computer, and AS Norsk Data was for some time Norway's biggest electronics company. This model was used in the world's first automatic ship bridge, developed here in Trondheim. The next step was dynamic positioning for ships, where you calculate how to keep the ship in the exact same place. And that means you can station your ship over a point and drill for oil. Balkan's group was a key player. Over the years, many different groups at the university have used their computer-based know-how to build important relationships with the oil and gas industry worldwide. The story continues today and into the future with the creation in 2013 of the Center of Excellence for Autonomous Marine Operations and Systems. The center was recognized by the Research Council of Norway with a grant totaling 175 million kroner over the next 10 years. Some of the greatest achievements of the computer are the ones we don't see. Enormous amounts of data are shared every day. Think about credit card transactions, online banking, online medical records. But making this flow efficient is far from simple. I like using BIBSYS, the Norwegian University Library System, as an example. It started in 1972 with this report, as a project led by Ingeborg Sølberg. She created a system that organized collection and user data in such a robust way it could later be scaled to the national level. It's a wonderful example of smooth and efficient transfer of data and physical items. But the success of BIBSYS was not the actual program, but the deep understanding of the mechanisms it was going to serve. Before you can have a product, you need to have a vision. And in order to have a vision, you need self-confidence, creativity and imagination. 
NTNU's most important product is not only new technologies and patents, but people who have a strong knowledge base and a creative mindset. The need for a more formalized teaching system grew stronger during the 1960s, and in 1972, the Department of Computer Science was founded. A full four-year program for IT studies was started in 1978, and the first computer engineers received their diplomas in 1982. More than 52,000 engineering students have received a basic computer education since teaching began. Since the 1980s, another several thousand specialists have also been trained. These graduates now hold key positions in businesses, industry, and the public sector in Norway and worldwide. While much about the students has changed, students still have their dreams. I can imagine a future where positioning technology enables us an unimaginable set of new features. Today, you have to find the information you seek, but in the future, information will find you based on your needs and your location. I believe we've seen nothing yet. In 1986, computing in Trondheim took another giant leap forward, and this time into the heady world of supercomputing. With the purchase of the Cray supercomputer, the university now had the most powerful number cruncher in all of Scandinavia. The Cray was a paradigm shift in another way because it completely redefined the computer's place in science and engineering. The supercomputer gave construction and petroleum engineers an incredible tool. They could model oil reservoirs and build giant concrete structures for oil platforms. Supercomputers also allowed the development of multi-phase flow, or the ability to transport oil, gas and water in the same pipe. In terms of sheer economic worth, this technology may be the most significant Norwegian invention ever. The internet in the 1990s took the world by storm. But there was a lot of information out there. So what was the best way to sift through it all? Based on the research of Arne Hallos and Tor Ramstad, fast search and transfer was established in 1997. The company was founded on 15 years of research into tailor-made hardware for search algorithms like this card here. One of the student projects, FTP Search, was Norway's most popular website in the mid-1990s. The search engine All the Web was an immense success when it was launched in 1999. For some time it was both bigger and better than Google. Fast left the search engine war in the early 2000s and All the Web was sold to Yahoo. Fast was later known for its great success with tailor-made enterprise search, used by businesses. In 2008 the company was acquired by Microsoft and is today a vital part of the software giant's SharePoint product. All of this made Trondheim a search engine hotspot and brought other search companies to the city. Back to that mobile phone in your pocket, which is so much more than a phone these days. Many game-changing technologies had to be developed to make it what it is today, several of which have their roots in Trondheim's computer culture. One important part of GSM, the digital mobile standard, which is used by roughly 90% of all cell phones, was developed here at Grösseven. Torleif Mossang and colleagues developed an approach to mobile telephony in 1987 that was adopted as an important part of the European mobile telephone standard. GSM was just one of many advances enabled by the computing know-how in Trondheim. Cutting-edge research in robotics, high-performance computing, smart grids, and complex sensor networks also grew out of this ever-deepening expertise. Another thing about your phone is that it's not just a phone. It's a miniature computer, and it keeps getting smaller and lighter. Starting in 1993, one visionary professor, Einar Johan Oss, asked his students, could you build a low-energy microprocessor? This challenge led to a remarkable outpouring of creative engineering companies and ideas. Alf Egel Bugen and Vegard Wallen created AVR Architecture, a microprocessor technology now owned by Atmel. They were two of many who had Oss as a supervisor and who were challenged and energized by his approach. We shouldn't forget about the computer games. Virtually every computer fanatic started their careers doing this. But then they started asking, how is it made? How can I make it better? And how can I create something new? This is what students and researchers do with computers at NTNU. They understand. They improve. They invent. <laughs>